as people are more people are joining we're reaching 30 so hopefully the others will join as we as we do the introductions welcome everyone to episode 7 of the football for all talks um, these talks are a series of uh, discussions around sport disability and innovation and they're organized by our nonprofit organization integrated dreams um, who some of you might know better from the Football for All Leadership Program, a program designed to promote employability, entrepreneurship, and networking of disabled people in football, um, or more broadly, in sport. Uh, they are organized in partnership with CAFE, the Center for Access to Football in Europe, uh, who is our friend and partner in the program and delivers a, an accessibility, a stadium accessibility workshop during uh, the training program. Um, we have uh, today, uh, this session is being recorded and you have live captions uh, on uh, Otter, which uh, should be available to all of you in the live streaming service link on the screen. And there's also a link in the chat box uh, if it makes it easier for people to join. Uh, for anyone who has any questions, uh, please drop in the chat box or in the Q&A and we'll do our best to answer the questions as we go today. Uh, I know today will be, uh, time will be very short to, for all our speakers. Um, we are honored to have here on our panel today um, four uh, fantastic speakers. Um, and I will introduce them shortly and then we'll go straight into the discussion. So with us we have um, Eli Wolf, who is a Paralympian and the director of the uh, Power of Sport Lab, a uh, platform for everyone to share their Power of Sport stories. Um, Eli is also a sport management uh, educator at the University of Connecticut and the University of Massachusetts in Boston. He's an advisor for the UN Sport uh, for Development and Peace Initiatives and Activities, co-founder and advisor to the Sport and Society Initiative at Brown University. Amongst many other things, Eli led the global effort to include provisions addressing sport and recreation within the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, also with us is Jess Markt. He has a background in communications uh, and he is the International Committee to, uh, Red Cross, um, for the Red Cross Disability Sport and Inclusion Advisor. He creates programs focused on breaking down the stigma of physical disability in countries dealing with effects of war and conflict. Jess has also worked with the, with the Red Cross um, Physical Rehabilitation Program to build and develop wheelchair basketball and other disability, disability sport programs in several countries. The only female uh, speaker on our panel today, but I couldn't think of a better person to represent our gender. Uh, we have Joyce Cook, who is, the, who is FIFA's first Chief Social Responsibility and Education Officer. Uh, Joyce has held uh, senior management positions at FIFA since 2016. Before that, she was CAFE's founding and managing director and had also senior roles in other organizations promoting equality in the UK. And finally, we have Kush Kanodia, uh, an award-winning advocate and uh, social entrepreneur. He's an advisor and also has senior roles in many charities, nonprofits, uh, and in the NHS in the UK, including uh, in organizations that have been our guests here in these talks, um, like CAFE or the Global Disability Innovation Hub. Uh, you can add any, any to those, uh, Kush, if I missed any. Um, he's the current Chief Disability Officer at Kaleidoscope Group of Companies. Uh, companies that are working to promote inclusion of disabled people um, in many interesting ways. Uh, look it up. Uh, he's also an ambassador for Disability Rights UK and was a torchbearer for uh, the Paralympic Games in London in 2012. So that was a very short introduction. All of these speakers have far uh, longer um, experience, uh, but uh, I didn't want to, you know, anyone, any of you can add to that as we, as we go on. Um, as you know, we've been having these talks since the beginning of, of October. We've touched upon several topics, but there are common thing, themes in all of those conversations. And we talk obviously about equality for disabled people, um, equal opportunities, uh, that that is the right thing to do, but it's also the smart thing to do uh, to provide equal opportunities to the disabled population. Um, now, the million dollar question is, 
uh, how do we get there? Uh, and that's where we'll uh, ask our, our panelists to, to help shed some light on, on this question. Uh, Eli, I would start with you. Uh, you worked, as I said, on the UN Convention for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, specifically on Article 30, ensuring the right to participate in recreational, leisure, and sporting activities. Why, why did you decide to, to focus on this? Was it being an athlete yourself that you found uh, drove you uh, to, to push for, for such a change? Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much for uh, having us, this amazing panel and conversation today. Um, yeah, just to jump right into it, uh, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, particularly Article 30, it really provides that uh, global framework, you know, in terms of thinking about the rights of people with disabilities and what that means, and going from kind of a medical model to a social and rights-based model. Um, and also it really embraces the whole spectrum of opportunities and, and all the diversity of disability. And so being able to put sport into that conversation and kind of recognize how the right to sport and physical activity, recreation and play is so important for the human condition. And really to think about, you know, all sport organizations, all entities, all recreation, all physical activity organizations, that all of them, you know, thinking about how, how they have that important population of individuals with disabilities. I mean, so for me kind of coming into it and getting engaged, you know, for me having a background and being really interested in human rights and in interested in issues of inclusion, um, having the opportunity to work on, the, on Article 30 and collaborating with so many people around the world. Yeah, it was a really amazing opportunity. Um, but also just at that time, it was really interesting because right as the UN was starting to do more with sport broadly, it kind of was able to bring in disability into this broader platform that the UN is doing on sport for development and sport and human rights. So, so I think it's, it's really a powerful um, opportunity for awareness. Um, there's a lot of work still to be done. You know, there's still so much can be done, but I think that having this kind of pie in the sky, this benchmark, this framework, it, it's really useful, um, you know, for, for everybody around the world to realize that this is, this is not just kind of the, a pity story. This is not just, oh, feel bad for people with disabilities, but there is this kind of rights approach and recognizing that, that people with disabilities have a rightful place at the table particularly within the sporting and world. So, so that's just a little bit of that, but yeah, it's, it's kind of provides that kind of starting point. Uh, absolutely. Um, having a framework is, I believe everyone would agree here on the panel uh, is, is super important. Um, probably as an athlete yourself, you saw you know, the, the social and uh, health benefits to, to participating in sport, uh, in your case, in, in team sport. Um, and how that could change everyone's life, abled or disabled. Um, yeah. Kush, um, you have, uh, uh, I mean, you work in uh, around advocacy uh, uh, for disabled rights, but also a lot uh, around uh, health issues. And the ties between, as I said, health uh, and sports is are numerous either for recreations, recreational sports or for competition uh, sports. And you're, you're a fierce advocate. You successfully ran the No Wheelchair Tax NHS campaign to eliminate uh, disabled parking charges at, uh, at NHS uh, facilities. Um, why have you chosen to, to focus on, on sport in the context of the work that you do? Because you, you, know, you work uh, as well with ethnic minorities, correct? Um, why is it so important for you to, to be involved in organizations that are also tied to, to sports, such as Cup, for, for example? I guess like being a disabled person since childhood, I know the importance of organizations such as the NHS, for example. So the reason I can walk today is because I've had my hips replaced um, in the NHS CAD CAM. If it wasn't for the NHS, I, I wouldn't be able to walk. And I know the benefits and the power of sports um, through being a torchbearer and by going to football games. Um, 
the like some of the things that I've kind of really focused on is kind of the interconnected nature of reality. So being a disabled person, if I can't manage my health, then that's going to affect my ability to access education. It's going to affect my ability to access employment. It's going to affect my ability to access sporting organizations. So the no wheelchair tax campaign, for example, that helped to abolish all disabled car parking charges um, in NHS hospitals, that was supposed to be implemented in April. Now it's been delayed to January, but it's very profound, significant systems change. So you're talking about 206 NHS hospitals in England, you're talking about 2.5 million disabled people with a blue badge. The new campaign is to create a standardized and compassionate disabled parking policy in the UK where the inner, inner London boroughs provide four hours free and the outer London boroughs would be free and that would be replicated at all councils in England. I've already got Kensington and Chelsea to make a change from one hour to four hours and that enables access to three of the, the leading hospitals in the UK, Chelsea Westminster, the Royal Brompton, which is a cardiology specialist hospital and the Royal Marsden, which is a cancer specialist hospital. And how that impacts in relation to sports, obviously, you know, health being critical, but I also saw a really interesting stat recently in the cafe, um, the summary um, report, the impact of COVID-19 which stated that 87% of respondents indicated that they would not use public transport to travel to matches upon return to the stadium. So having accessible um, systems where disabled people can park their cars is going to be critical in relation to sports, the same way it's going to be critical in relation to education and employment, especially when there's an added risk in relation to using public transport in kind of a post-COVID world. Thank you, Kush. Um, you're absolutely right. And we'll get into those issues of uh, around COVID a little bit later on um, and how it's affecting disproportionately uh, disabled, the disabled population. Um, Joyce, you have been working now for several years at FIFA. It's a global organization recognized by everyone everywhere in the world. Um, FIFA has some well-known initiatives uh, around promoting diversity uh, and anti-discrimination, the FIFA Diversity Award. The Russia World Cup was recognized as the most inclusive, um, I would say, not only World Cup, but football event uh, around the world. Uh, soccer for those uh, listening across the, the ocean. Um, you've also published uh, the FIFA World Cup Sustainability Strategy for Qatar. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing in right now and what you're working on uh, moving forward um, to harness this power of football for good? Thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity this evening and, and I'd like to reiterate, as, as Eli said, you know, it's a great uh, panel, real experts, uh, you know, we live and breathe um, this issue or, or challenge day to day in our own personal lives as well as uh, understanding the context in all our different uh, ways and means. And, you know, I think there's several things maybe, I don't know if you're going to pick up on these a bit later. I think what's really important is the work that FIFA is doing alongside confederations such as UEFA through the work that CAFE has done and I'm very pleased to have been part of championing that for the last 20 years because one of the things of sports we were forgetting is that actually if you don't have accessibility and as, as Kush has just uh, referred to in regards to healthcare in any context for most disabled people that's a barrier before you even start and it is not easy in most cases for disabled people to be spontaneous and that's when we have real inclusion and equality when spontaneity of whether you go to a football match or whatever it is um, is just a given and we're a very long way from that and we're kidding ourselves if we think we're not um, across the world and I think the work that we as FIFA do in regards to making sure our tournaments are properly accessible and that's an ever ongoing journey of, of including other areas such as sensory rooms, such as changing places, toilets and so on, um, it has to continue. In addition, we are working now, and I'm probably breaking cover a little bit, on a, on a disability football toolkit, 
we've taken a very close look at disability football across the globe. And of course, there are areas of the world where this is really developed. We know and understand that disability football has many different versions. Um, that can be certainly confusing for people that want to step into this, including our member associations. Of course, we have 211 member associations around the world and, and how and what they do. We still have, I'm, I'm very clear on this, a world where people are also either afraid to discuss disability matters because they're fearful of saying the wrong thing, of offending, of not understanding, or indeed limiting us by assuming that we have more limited um, capabilities. And, and I think that's one of the biggest barriers that we know we face is, is the attitudinal barrier. So that we have a lot of work to do. We clearly can and will do more at FIFA to raise awareness around all of these areas. And, you know, I, I just take a moment to applaud Integrated Dreams and the important work you're doing in regards to finding pathways for employment for disabled people in sports. I'm very proud to be the first disabled woman to hold such a senior position at FIFA. I hope and pray by the time I retire, I am not the only senior person in such an administration role in sports. And I know there are one or two others and they're amazing champions, but we've tended to focus on the, uh, the playing aspect, which of course is crucially important for all the reasons we've said, but what we've got to get better at now is those talent pathways and creating the jobs and meaningful recruitment. And that means we've got to ensure that our organizations actually do recruit in an accessible way. And that also we're prepared to provide the accessible requirements for people to do their job day to day. And I think that's something we've got to get better at. And we've got to empower disabled people to have that vision and see. And of course, you know, I, I, I hear we're going to talk about COVID more, but the reality of COVID is it's putting education back. And when we look around the globe where we're speaking in, in parts of the world where there's so much more development still needed and at hand and if people are not given that education from the get-go and equitable education as disabled people we're already you know far behind the curve and, and I became disabled later in life as, as, as friends and colleagues know and it was an absolute shock to me at how different it was and I'm, I'm also a gay woman and you know I don't like to compare but it, but it, you know I, I think there's still a deep lack of understanding of 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 rights, as you've said, Eli, you know, in the end, this is about rights, this is about human rights. And I think that often gets lost in that people are seen in this more charitable way as disabled people, we've got to change that landscape. And, and I think those are some of the elements where we can help as, as FIFA and football and the voice we have. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Joyce. Um, we'll come back to some of those issues as well, definitely. Um, I'd like to go to, to, to Jess uh, now and um, speaking a bit, uh, touching a, a bit on what Joyce said about, uh, you know, uh, there are places in the world that uh, where the divide was already there, um, COVID most likely will, uh, you know, uh, emphasize um, that, the, that, uh, that divide and, and exclude uh, people further, unfortunately. Um, you've been working in countries that are no short of challenges. Um, you, you've been in Afghanistan, Palestine, South Sudan, Bangladesh, you know, just to name a few. Um, you're, when, when we have a look at the, the projects you've been working on, I think the impact of the projects are, is palpable. I would encourage everyone to, to watch a short movie that has won a few awards called the No Limits Wheelchair Basketball in South Sudan. Um, could you share a little bit of your story with us and, and why, why did you decide to you know, develop these, uh, these inclusive sports programs uh, so far away from, from where you're from? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks again, um, as everybody else has said, for, for the opportunity to speak on such a, an amazing and, and meaningful panel. Um, I, I got into this to, to make a, a very long story short. Um, as I was a wheelchair basketball player, I had never coached before, and I was playing for, for a team in New York, where I was living at the time, and got a random email from a woman who had just come back from Afghanistan 
who had met one of the first wheelchair basketball teams there um, that had just started playing and were, were looking for somebody to come and teach them how to play the game. And she sent out an email to everybody she could find on the internet related to wheelchair basketball, one of which was, was the team I was playing for. And um, of however many people received that email asking for a coach to go to a village in the north of Afghanistan in 2009, I think I was the only person who thought that that sounded like a good idea at the time. So uh, from there, I, I had the opportunity to meet the International Committee of the Red Cross while I was while I was in Afghanistan that first trip and have then started uh, at that time started a partnership with them um, to, to create a couple additional teams in Afghanistan and bring some some equipment in so that people could learn how to play wheelchair basketball in a proper way. And it's just continued to expand in the, the 11 years since. Um, and now I've been working for about three years um, heading the ICRC's Disability Sport and Inclusion Program, uh, which has now expanded to have sport programs in around 20 countries dealing with conflict and, and other forms of violence around the world. Um, but the, the reason I think I, I got into this after that first trip, which I thought at the time would just be a one-time thing, you know, and I would have a crazy story to tell my grandkids someday, um, was that I saw the, the power that sport had to really change the personal identity of the people who I was having the, the chance to teach. Um, you know, we, we all have, have challenges dealing with the, the stigma and, and, and issues surrounding being a disabled person in, in the world these days. And certainly COVID is exacerbating those, those issues. But to see the difference in the way someone experiences disability in a village in Afghanistan or in Gaza, uh, Palestine or South Sudan or any of the other places where the ICRC works, it just speaks to the, the type of resilience that those people have and that just being given a small opportunity like a chance to join a wheelchair basketball team or more recently for us amputee football teams completely changes the ability of that person to see themselves as a, a integrated part of their societies. They, they suddenly can transform from identifying solely as a person with a disability to, to self-identifying as an athlete or from being an athlete, uh, an employee or a business owner or a husband or a father or, uh, or mother. Um, and so all of these sorts of transformations were the kind of attendant impacts of getting into sport. And so having seen the power of that transformation from, from very early on in, in this process, it's just continued to motivate me to, to get further and further into the sphere and deal with incredible people like those we're talking to on this call to eventually effectuate a breaking down of that stigma through sport um, and, and hopefully seeing a much more inclusive world in the near future. Fantastic stuff, uh, Jess. A very inspiring um, story uh, in terms of how you leaped into, you know, what others would probably run ran away from. Uh, we, I mean, as I said, looking at the, the, the short movie, you can actually, you can almost feel uh, the impact that your, that your, the, the, the program had on those, uh, those wheelchair basketball players. Uh, Last week, we had uh, Vicky Austin from the Global Disability Innovation Hub speaking, and she also mentioned the importance of uh, uh, when working in, you know, in challenging uh, situations, the importance of, of involving communities in, in the work that, uh, that is done on the ground to make sure that the programs are actually effective um, and, and promote uh, sustainable change. Um, that actually, you know, involves those uh, living in those communities. Uh, Kush, uh, you, as I said, you've had experience working with uh, disabled people's issues, also with ethnic minorities. Um, you work a lot with bigger with or, or, or with organizations that are advocates in the in this context. But uh, how important do you think 
uh, it is um, in terms of sport and uh, disabled people's rights uh, to, to practice sport at any level, how important is it on, on the ground to, to work with uh, you know, existing projects in, 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 in the communities uh, already, in your case, in the UK in particular? So the disability mantra is nothing about us without us. And I think we always have to embody this a mantra in everything that we do. And I think the way that we can make sustainable programs is to co-design and co-produce these programs. We need to see what assets there's already in the community. We need to see where the gaps are. And then we can work in the best ways that we possibly can to, to address because we don't want to keep replicating um, things that are already there. I think sometimes we see that in international development, unfortunately, that you have multiple organizations going to a place and kind of replicating what is already there. I think it's really important that we analyze what is the externality actions of what we do. If we measure all the ex externality actions, then we can have an honest conversation. Are we providing a net positive or a net negative impact to the local community? So like one of the examples I like to use is, um, you know, there may be say like a charity that recycles fishing nets, for example. And that may work very well in certain countries where there's an issue of waste fishing nets. But then this charity wanted to do it in India but in India, all the nets are already recycled because we generally try to use everything. So then the idea was, we'll export fishing nets to India, then recycle them there. But then the problem that some charities, international development organizations don't understand is then you're impacting a supply chain in India where there's already existing jobs in India. So I think it's really important that we have honest conversations and really kind of follow our inner voice as organizations, because sometimes we get so focused on kind of PR and marketing that I think if we don't have these honest conversations, then we risk actually creating a, a net negative instead of a net positive. Well, that's absolutely true. We also always talk about the positive impact that sport can have, and we sometimes forget that uh, we it might be negative as well uh, if we don't do it in, the, in a certain in the right way, involving the right people, uh, especially when there are cultural differences involved um, in certain parts of the world. That is absolutely a very good point um, to make, uh, Kush. Thank you. Um, Joyce, you mentioned uh, uh, the Disability Football Toolkit. I'm very interested in this. Uh, I wasn't aware that you were developing um, uh, the toolkit. Um, we, we, I had a whole section of this conversation around uh, you know, the, the one umbrella governing body. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the toolkit? Is it... Um, FIFA does not uh, hold governing, uh, is not governing disabled football at the moment. Um, what is the perspective of it? Is it more on, uh, um, you know, uh, using football for social development and social inclusion? Is it, uh, you mentioned a little bit, it's to also to inform and educate people because it is, disabled football is a, a, a different landscape. Um, there's, you know, 11 different disciplines, it's, it can be tricky with all of these layered governing bodies and it differs from country to country. Could you tell us a little bit more mm -hmm. about what yeah. it is? So, so it's a project we're just starting. Um, I, I don't want to put people on the spot here, but very much uh, we, we've honed in particularly on US soccer and the English FA because they have uh, done so much progressive work over a long period in this area. But what we did, and, and uh, even when I was still in the member associations division, so when I joined FIFA in 2016, my role was as chief uh, member associations officer to set up the new forward development program, which is the funding pro program for the 211 member associations. And we looked at that point of how we could look across a, a number of different inclusion elements of uh, embedding that as obligations within in the funding program. And also understanding very well, and you know, in my context from my previous roles, 
that like anybody else, uh, an athlete wants to uh, raise or, or win an Olymp Olympic medal or, or raise the World Cup and have a, a World Cup medal, of course, that's the aspiration of, of every boy and girl that plays football. And um, in that context, we undertook a, a piece of work to look across our 211 member associations because everything we do has to be in a coordinated response with the governing body of them and where disability football in particular was up to. And there is a massive chasm, as, as of course we know, uh, across those 211 members. It's huge. You know, we can turn where there's really good developed work and the NGOs that, that have their own versions of the World Cup do an incredible job. And there's roundabout from our last look about 78 countries that are in, in at least some of the disciplines have 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 their version of a of a of a world cup tournament and it's something we would like very much as fifa to step into but it has to be in a context where there's a broad stretch and of course if we look in europe there are more developed countries if we look to north america and parts of south america but there are huge gaps in between and encouraging our members to step into this area what was clear is that for some they certainly would like to do so that they didn't know where to start they didn't know which ngos to speak to um, some are still seen as very much in a charitable sphere of doing the right thing for disabled people and of course this is um, elite football at the highest level in disability football. So what we've understood is we've got to be able to bring some more parity around the world before we can seriously talk about FIFA World Cups, disability football World Cups. It's an aim we want to have, but until there's a more uh, equitable balance across the globe, we're not in a position to do it yet at a, at, a, at, a, at a governing body global level. That doesn't mean we don't have an appetite for it, but first of all, we've got to get this part up and running. And you know, if we're really honest in this platform, because we can be, because we're talking together as disabled people, there is a mixture of NGOs within certain disability football that don't get on together though, if we're really honest about it. And that's very difficult for uh, a member association, a federation, for a sports governing body to find a meaningful way forward. So I think as disabled people, and I was very familiar with this, if I can take my FIFA hat off, and that was one of the things that um, certainly when I uh, came to level playing field and we found a cafe was to say, if we can't work together, as Kush said, we're not gonna have much chance to, to convince the rest of the world. So I think it's really important we do that. And what the toolkit will do is introduce member associations to a number of ways they can support disability football. And it might be they are working with the established NGOs. And I think that's probably the best way to build capacity with their expertise. But of course, that's gonna take some resourcing. And in addition to understand that if you have a weekend uh, um, festival of disability football, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually doing something sustainable and meaningful for the long term. So helping members to understand a much more progressive way forward. And there's been some great work in that we know as well already. And we really want to add to that, but we want to add value. And we have to start by building the capacity in all two, well, not all 211, but the majority. And once we get a, a, a sort of critical mass, then we can have discussions at FIFA about perhaps setting up a disability football unit and, and something more meaningful for the long term. But that's got to be the first port of call. And that's what we're aiming to create. And I don't want to, I can see, I can see Stuart on the call. I don't want to put people under pressure. Um, and, but, you know, it is what we're going to do. And we're asking the NGOs in disability football to please work with us through that platform because we, we really want to come up with something meaningful and reach out to them, but in a coordinated way. And Eli's uh, already, I don't want to put Eli on the spot as well, but we've asked Eli to, to step in and help us as well in that regard. And uh, it's great to, to meet Jess today because maybe we should, uh, we, should, we should hook Jess in as well. But that's the aim of it. So we can begin to really build meaningful global capacity. That's great news, Joyce. Thank you for sharing. Um, uh, really looking forward to, to seeing that happen. And the FIFA name does carry some weight when you, mm. you're, if you are the ones who are you know, pulling people together uh, to move forward, I'm sure that will have a, mm. um, uh, an impact. Um, uh, Jess, I, I'm curious about the way you run your programs on the ground, um, involving all of these moving parts, communities, accessibility challenges, access to equipment. Um, 
in this perspective of uh, you know using sport for good uh, changing uh, people's identities also changing perceptions at the same time how do you how do you coordinate all of these moving parts in the sense that you're building disability sports programs in countries that might have some structure uh, there might have might not have uh, you know governing bodies etc how do you set up these programs uh, in order for them to actually develop into competitions allow people to then participate in at international level um, you know competitions tell us a little bit of how how you said you set up the, the programs well it's a really good question and the answer is it's a bit different in each place um, so as you said in some of the countries where we operate, um, there are structures in place. There are, let's say, national Paralympic committees, or even in some cases, um, local sport federations um, that are that are sort of set up to help to promote um, one or more disability sports. The the challenge that we try to help alleviate is to come in and help with a, you know, access to equipment. Um, be accessibility um, where we can in terms of making sure that playing facilities are accessible to people with different mobility impairments, um, which is a, obviously a, a huge issue in, in many of the countries where we work. Um, but then also to try to advise and, and provide support in terms of governance and, and helping to set up structures that will allow these programs to eventually become fully locally sustainable. So from the very beginning, the goal of the ICRC in promoting uh, adaptive sport in the countries where we operate, it was not to come in and sort of run our own programs. Although in some cases we, we have had to do that just because of lack of, of other available resources in those countries, but to set up structures where, you know, we're training coaches, referees, uh, classifiers, um, and, and administrators in all of these countries so that after a few years, they're gradually taking more and more of the load on themselves um, and the ICRC can play more and more of a supporting role um, along with other critical um, international partners with, with whom we work. But the, the entire goal is really to, to focus on that sustainability. And in terms of the, the sort of progression of you know, grassroots sport up to international competition, the way we approach it is that we try to ensure that three different levels are available. So we, we start development in places where maybe a given sport doesn't exist or, or is just very minimally started. We start with that grassroots focus, which is really just enabling as many people with physical disabilities, which is the population with whom we work, um, as many people as possible are getting the opportunity to play. And in many of the countries where we work, you can understand that the, the general assumption about people with disabilities, especially those with, with very visible disabilities, is that they really stay at home. The, their families care for them. It's not necessarily a, a pejorative disinclusion, but one where it's assumed that they don't have the personal capacity or power to lead sort of a proactive life. So what we try to do is start to change that at the, at the very basic level by getting them out of the home into a more active um, team oriented structure and start to build that confidence that then can lead to more competitive sport. And those, so from that area, we will take it to sort of national sport or national competitive development where we'll, we'll set up national championships, local teams, provincial teams, and start to create that momentum of people starting that the people that really identify, you know, with that, that athletic pursuit, get the chance to compete at a higher level. And then once that's developed, we start to move into the international level and take, you know, the really committed, um, talented, motivated um, athletes, and give them the opportunity to represent their country on the international stage. And I think it's so critical for all three of those components to be in place, because if you, for instance, focus just on the grassroots element, then there's really not that, that striving of the players to, to reach that next level. They, they don't get to see sort of 
the the example of their their heroes at the the national or international level reaching um, those great heights. And so that that is motivation and as well provides a lot of visibility for the broader community into the power of of adaptive sport and the talent of these athletes and what they can contribute not only as sports people but also in broader society. So we just try to create programs that lead to sustainability and incorporate all three of those competitive aspects as well. That's great. We've been having over the sessions, and I know that some of the participants in those sessions uh, are here listening today as well. Some questions regarding, you know, in, in countries where the sophistication is not there yet, uh, how can they start to set up um, programs that uh, promote inclusion through sport? Uh, and there is a, 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 an eager, a, an eagerness there uh, to yeah. participate in, in global competitions. I would like to take what Joy said about the toolkit and the, and the disabled football, um, and ask Eli. You're you're from the U.S. obviously, and um, the U.S. Uh, has given us uh, a few examples uh, in the last year, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, where you have not only have you had U.S. soccer already governing um, parts of disabled football, but you have also one Olympic and Paralympic committee, um, uh, which is, uh, in my opinion, a major breakthrough as well. Um, you were talking before about the need to have a framework and have a structure. Um, in, in sport and in, in competition sports and, and obviously beyond competition sports, but talking now a little bit more about um, competition sports. Um, do you think this is the way to go? Absolutely, uh, having everything under one roof, you know, ideally, of course, it is uh, a path that we have to, to go on to, to get there eventually. Um, and maybe the US was, uh, was in better position to do that. Do you think that moving forward, do you see that more happening more often? Thank you. That's no, really, I think a really good question. And I think it's just in terms of thinking about the different approaches and how to engage, particularly in terms of thinking about kind of the uh, main, if you think about mainstream institutions and kind of what they do and what they stand for. And if you look at, also if you look at the history of integration of around women into sport and the integration of racial ethnic minorities. So I think it, when you kind of put into that context of thinking about disability in the same way of thinking about how do you think about inclusive models, um, but also ones that may be collaborative. So in terms of how do we create partnership models, um, ones where we're, we, we create dynamics of inclusion and where maybe it's a couple organizations working together, but still being able to have that uh, mantra or the ability to have the support and the, the, um, the kind of the, the imprimatur, that's sort of the word, the imprimatur of the mainstream institution. I think that that really stays a lot, that says and states a lot in this world, um, because if a, if a soccer entity or a basketball entity or hockey, you know, if you're if everyone in the country or in the world is looking to that organization as the standard organization, and then they're not having anything around disability, if they're not creating partnerships, if they're not really working, even if it's from a growth standpoint, um, and I think here we are, you know, in 2020, you know, so if we're thinking about all the progress that's been made on on women in sport and all the progress that's been made and particularly around you know Black Lives Matter and race and, and inclusion in sport. And so when we're looking at diversity and inclusion and non-discrimination for, for disability to not be in that conversation, I think that that says something and it, it talks about the value that disability has as kind of not in that light. Um, so I think for the for organizations to come at it in terms of that ability to engage the different entities, whether it is the Paralympic partnership or, or, or deaf sport or special Olympics or other types of disability groups to at least have those kinds of collaborations. Um, you know, we have to also recognize the reality of that disability is evolving. You know, it's, it's evolving into sport and international and national organizations are, are getting their head around it and, and recognizing that they can bring 
people with disabilities that um, that have you know background and expertise and knowledge and you know part of it is to have those champions you know to have those people that can be in the boardroom that can have the expertise and so I think more and more there's there's people with disabilities and this whole nothing about us without us and and all of these different elements of of creating dynamics that allow mainstream entities um, to be able to engage more. Um, but at the same time, because disability has been evolving, it's still, you know, probably 10 to 15 years, 20 years um, of more evolution. But at least to take those initial strides to do those that the legwork to build that foundation of, of um, embracing disability. And so, you know, I think it was 20 years ago when I, um, a couple of colleagues and I wrote a proposal to US soccer about uh, embracing disability into the federation and um, you know it has been an evolution you know it's a cross disability pan disability um, committee and so we it, it works across the different disciplines um, the Paralympic ones have uh, because of the amateur sports act in the United States they have a little bit more standing but there's also all the other groups that are still a part of the federation in different ways and have created membership status and in different ways of being engaged. Um, it's also the dynamics of, of creating different types of events and different types of um, moments um, to, to really celebrate and to acknowledge and to value. You know, part of it is how do you go from kind of a lip service tokenism to toward um, really valuing. And so, you know, that can happen in a lot of different ways and a, and a lot of different elements. Um, but when the US Olympic Committee um, did it and we made some progress, not only on the name change, they also um, worked for many, you know, there's a number of us that were asking questions about equal pay for the athletes coming out of the Olympics and the Paralympics. And um, basically we were able to kind of make, there was some change in leadership and there was a, several moments of recognition that this could happen, you know, that you could actually have equal pay for Olympians and Paralympians coming out of the Olympics. Um, so I think some of it's just the timing of it, some of it's the leadership, some of it's the training. So all the things that really Joyce and Kush and Jess have really talked about and highlighted, the, putting these dynamics into place. Um, but I think to have those international and national organizations having a role is really important. You know, it's really critical um, to, to valuing and to embracing and creating that sense of dignity and from a sport perspective. So rather than it, you know, these are athletes, like uh, Jess had said, and like Kush and Joyce have said that, you know, these are athletes first. And so how do we do that? And what are the best, how do we create those dynamics? How do we create the right kind of partnerships? Um, but again, I, I think we all have to realize that even though it is 2020 and obviously you wanna be further along, at the same time, you know, we are where we are, um, you know, and I, I think just one final point I'll say is that it's really interesting, um, even in the Olympic charter right now, the, uh, the word disability does not appear. And so, you know, even if we could put disability into the Olympic charter, you know, that the, in the way that other organizations are now putting disability into their language, you know, just to say that disability is not just an external thing, but this is a part of our sports culture and across dis there's invisible disabilities, visible, you know, so I think creating those dynamics is really important. Agree. Um, talking about change and the, pa the, the, the pace at, at which it can happen. Uh, uh, Kush, you actually were the one who mentioned this uh, initiative to us, uh, the Valuable 500. Um, it's an initiative by Carolyn Casey, who's uh, an Irish activist. Um, you might have seen a few of her TED Talks. Um, she's essentially trying by January to have uh, 500 CEOs from private sector uh, major uh, organizations um, commit to having um, this disability inclusion on their, on their agenda. Um, in their in their corporations, um, do you also think Kush that uh, this is a, a way to go to 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 make the the needle move quicker quicker than if we just uh, let things take their own course? Inclusion is definitely going to happen. 
but if we don't push for it, it will take uh, more than our lifetimes, uh, times, a few times uh, for us to see real change. Do you think that initiatives like, like the Valuable 500, where you, pu you put you know, big companies, uh, uh, you ask them to commit um, to some level of, uh, of change within the organization and perhaps within their distribution channels, et cetera, do you think that's a, a, a way we can hopefully uh, push for change to happen quicker? Definitely. So we're quite fortunate. So Carolyn, K Carolyn Casey presented at TechShare Pro um, last week, the largest accessibility and inclusive design event in Europe um, with AbilityNet. And she actually said that now her target is 500 and she's already reached 342 organizations which is remarkable. But to me, you know, the key aspects, it, so Valuable 500 was launched in Davos, I believe last year. And it was the first time disability inclusion was center stage. And I think the real powerful thing about the Valuable 500 initiative is Carolyn Casey works with chief executives and chairs of global organizations, you know, the largest multinationals in the world where the chief executive and the chair are basically making public statements saying, we as an organization are aligned with disability inclusion. And if you have the most powerful person in the organization make that statement, it has a ripple effect through the whole organization, whichever organization that is. Another key component of that um, for organizations that sign up is that it will be discussed at board level. So rather, one of the problems we have with disability is generally it gets pigeonholed into DNI, into HR. And if it's pigeonholed into a small sector within the organization, we're never going to have transformative change. So one of the key things that I really like that Carolyn Casey talks about, we need to move it out from DNI and think about it as sustainable change for the organization. And I think that's really critical, especially in, in, in the day and age that we are. And then she talks about like tangible kind of actions and outcomes that the organization will publish and you know they'll be measured against. And I think some from some of the initiatives, I, I don't know if you've seen the diversious video. I think that's a, a really good video that I recommend everybody sees because it shows the hypocrisy there is in in the industry. One of the figures I really like is it states that 90% of organizations talk about diversity, only 4% talk about disability. You know, disability is actually the largest minority group. You know, globally now we're talking about 1.85 billion people. It's huge. You know, the spending power, the purple pound, now it's valued at $13 trillion globally, we're talking about a population larger than China with practically a similar purchasing power as China. It's significant. And if you look at the most innovative companies, we're talking about Apple, we're talking about Google, we're talking about Microsoft, because they understand having universal design principles, having a cradle to grave business model is, is the most viable business model there is. So I think it's very significant what's happening in relation to the Valuable 500. And it will be great to see similar kind of change also happening in different industries to local government, to national government, to, to healthcare, um, to, yeah, to, to, to other aspects where, you know, unfortunately there's discrimination following on also from what Eli said, you know, until we get to proportional representation for disabled people, until we get to, having transparency of data, you know, the NHS recently implemented the Workforce Disability Equality Standard, the first time that they're actually being transparent about how many disabled people they employ. Then we can look at the different levels of hierarchy and then also the disability pay gap. You know, it's, there's, there's many aspects of discrimination that we're, we're gonna have to tackle them one by one. Absolutely. And you touched on, I mean, Joyce already mentioned it, uh, obviously, about employment. Um, we absolutely need to have uh, disabled people employed uh, in things that 
they want to do and they're good at doing and not necessarily tying uh, those roles to the fact that they are disabled. Um, of course, it all starts before with education, etc. But um, this is a message that we at, uh, at the program also always try to, to push for. Um, and really, because also everyone does their best when they're doing something that they you know, have a passion for. Um, and, and it's not difficult to be passionate for sports. Um, talking about organizations and employment, um, I would say that even before COVID, um, we were already in an international environment that is volatile, uh, ever changing. Um, and you know, how important is it, in your in your opinion, um, to have uh, you know the, such uh, diversity in an organization that actually contributes for it to be more resilient, to be more innovative? Um, you know, for all of those challenges and changes that uh, I suspect we will be facing with the development of technology, geopolitics changing, climate change, uh, etc. Um, Joyce, how do you see this uh, uh, at FIFA? Um, and do you see, you know, more people, more disabled people being, I don't know the number for FIFA, uh, but do you see more, more uh, disabled people being employed um, in, in, in FIFA, regardless of it? FIFA being, you know, in disabled football or not. So, so thank you, and it's a really important discussion point. And you know, I'd like to come back to my own experience. You know, when it was announced that I'd been appointed to this senior role at FIFA, I genuinely had messages from people, disingenuous messages of how was I going to possibly travel the world? Because as the chief of the member associations division, you know, I've traveled to, to, to many parts of the world to visit the member associations, to attend meetings and congresses and councils and all sorts. And that's been an interesting journey in itself. And, you know, as a disabled woman, um, what was interesting is the mobilization in, you know, Rwanda, Ethiopia, Th Thailand, all these different places around the world and ensuring a level of accessibility for me as one of the uh, senior management traveling to, to events or indeed visiting member associations and visiting their projects. And it, it was sobering to have a number of things happen. One, people questioning how I could be appointed to such a bit, uh, position and was it tokenistic because I couldn't possibly as a disabled person be traveling all around the world in this important role, not from within FIFA, but from outside FIFA. And then in addition, um, an assumption that I would come across time and time again, that I was the appointed disability officer for FIFA including from peers from within the disability community. So that really resonates for me how much work we have to do across this whole sector in that, you know, it's great and it's important and we applaud and welcome such an initiatives of signing up companies and their chief execs. But it's one thing to have a commitment to uh, disability inclusion. It's quite another to appoint somebody to a senior role in that organization. And that's when we begin to know that we're cracking the egg because there's the narrative as a disabled person who's evidently disabled being present in these senior decision-making jobs, roles, um, meetings, et cetera, and being very visible. But there's also a narrative of that talent pathway and creating that. And that's where we have this huge chasm at the moment that we have to do much more across as a, as a multi-stakeholder approach to improving. And it's something that we're looking at in at FIFA in how do we have more accessible recruitment. We, as an organization, by the nature of what we do, tend to recruit from around the world. For many of the roles, of course, we have a, a, um, a, a reach within Switzerland as the first priority because that's where we're based. But nevertheless, we do recruit globally uh, for very specialist roles. And it is still severely lacking and we don't see many disabled people applying for jobs. And we're looking at why that is and what more we can do. But until there is that pool of talent, it's like having more women in, 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 in the senior management. It's like having more women in an organization, but it's multiplied by an nth degree because of all the limitations that disabled people have faced and still face around, and around the world. And that's where I think Kush and, and Eli mentioned it. We will really start to make change because somebody cannot 
question when you raise these issues as a disabled person that works in sports and also to make sure that every decision that's taken is mindful of disabled people and thank you Kush because you know how many years I've banged the drum on this we are the largest minority of any and I would say this over and over we are the most oppressed and where there is the most work to do. And there is a real lack of understanding of disabled people by many. So we've got a lot of work to do. It's something we see at FIFA, but, but we've got a lot to do in this area. And I'd like to just touch back to disabled women in this regard as well. I will never forget as long as I live attending a UK parliamentary session that met with a group of teenage disabled young women and asked them about why they are dropping out of sports, why they don't uh, partake in, in either a fun, uh, health raising uh, capacity or indeed with an ambition for elite sports. And all of them said that it came down to peer pressure and self body image and I think this is something we often overlook and that's where our Paralympians in particular and we can do more at FIFA uh, around our, our, our football champions and, and elite football players disability football players so that this becomes more normalized and we have we can stop talking about superheroes because they're disabled people and talk about elite athletes so there's so much in all of that and we could probably have this conversation for another three hours and it would be lovely to do it but at least we you know we all know that at the stage we're on but we should also be brave enough to now actually be asking you know we rightly ask now that there is diversity in the boardroom in terms of ethnicity, um, in terms of gender, but I don't see anybody saying that actually, where are the disabled people at these decision-making tables as well? And that's what we have to change. Absolutely. Uh, I know we're very short on time, uh, but I would really like to also touch upon, uh, you know, the current unavoidable uh, issue a little bit. Um, we've discussed uh, as I said before in these talks, the fact that disabled people are disproportionately being uh, hit the hardest with uh, uh, COVID uh, for several reasons. Uh, it's enhancing already the tendency for isolation, uh, for uh, probably not seeking uh, you know, health care uh, when, when needed. Um, Jess, I would like to, to shoot this one to you, but uh, anyone can chip in uh, as, you, as you see appropriate. Are you optimistic, you know, in the middle of all of this, can, can one be optimistic? Will, do you think that, um, you know, considering all of the challenges that we already had before, uh, and, and Joyce made a very good point uh, by saying that, uh, uh, you know, there is a gender issue as well within, um, access for disabled women because even the European Union has data that shows that in access to education um, disabled women uh, are uh, the rates at which they they you know they proceed their with their studies is even lower than than men um, you have a global overview just of uh, you know you live in the US uh, you travel to all of these countries um, can you remain optimistic uh, in the middle of all of this in terms of how COVID will affect, um, you know, uh, the change as it's happening? Uh, do you think that it will, you know, uh, make us have sit down and have these conversations and really reflect on these issues and try to implement change? Or do you think it's, are you not, you are, you're not so optimistic? <laughs> you think we're going to go a little bit backwards? Well, I, I would start by saying that it would take more than just a global pandemic to to kill my optimism. Um, I, I don't think I would be in this line of work, nor would any of us, if we weren't already eternal optimists. Um, but it is it is a very present and real challenge. And I actually wrote a piece um, for for the ICRC Law and Policy blog a, a couple months ago that really touched on the. The potential impact that that COVID could have, particularly with regard to inclusion in the workforce um, of people with disabilities, and I think, you know, the challenge is, is not so specific to the issues that that disability already has, the barriers that we already have, and how those are exacerbated by COVID, but really more 
the rest of the world taking their eye off the ball when it comes to the progress that we're already, you know, starting to make, inching forward on on inclusion of people with disabilities. And I think, you know, listening to to Joyce and Eli and Kush talk about where we are now and how far we've come, but how far we still have to go with regard to to inclusion becoming a reality at the highest levels. You know, it's it's a term that I've started using within the ICRC because we're, believe it or not, um, dealing with our own challenges in terms of of really making disability inclusion a, a real part of our of our institution and and something we're working very hard at now. But the term that I've started to use is is effortless inclusion. Like that, that's when we will be at the place we need to be is when we don't have to have these conversations, when we don't have to appoint people, when it doesn't have to be an area of focus to include Authentic. people with disabilities. Authentic. It's just part of how organizations operate because people with disabilities bring the same types of skills, talents, and advantages to the job that anybody else might, and, and some very specific um, skills and advantages that other people wouldn't. So I think that there is still plenty of room for optimism. Um, and I, I do think that, you know, COVID hopefully will be, a, you know, a temporary barrier that, that we're dealing with and, and that we can sort of get back to building that momentum. But the issue is always about keeping everyone's eye on the ball and, and on the importance of continuing to focus on on this progress so that eventually we can still get to that point of, of effortless inclusion. Absolutely. We we have at the, at the Football for All Leadership Program, we have a kind of a, a privileged position that we are sitting uh, once a year with a group of people who have, you know, different disabilities. Um, some of them have common issues, but some of them don't have common issues at all. And it's um, it's uh, it's like a working group of uh, ideas where we can, you know, uh, every every single situation we hear something that we hadn't thought about uh, before. We're constantly learning um, to improve. Um, Eli, I don't know if you wanted to to add something. To yeah. That. Go ahead. I was just going to add briefly just about, um, yeah, I think that effortless or authentic, um, which is great. Yeah, I think that's really essential, important. I guess I, I wanted to speak for just one minute about um, the reality we're in. And um, I guess one of the things that I think a lot about is just the notion of adapting and resilience and the fact that this time is helping us become more aware of those things. And I think that that reality perhaps allows the world to think more about disability in a different way and the notion of having to adapt. Um, I guess that's one thing. And then the second thing has to do with mental health because I do think that the reality that we're in is really stressing and becoming more aware of mental health issues, which is also in the realm of disability. And so I think that we're all in our world becoming more and more of the mental health challenges and the mental health um, knowing we have to take care of ourselves, we have to take care of each other. And so I think that those elements, I think, are perhaps going to be uh, moments of awareness and maybe help for the tipping point. Um, but I just wanted to share those two thoughts on the question. Kush, please. Um, I, I just wanted to give some of the stats from the UK because it's been it's been it's been a disaster for disabled people, if I'm just completely honest, like three-fifths of all COVID-19 deaths in the UK have been disabled people. It's such a shocking statistic, but equally shocking is the lack of media coverage. So like I'm, you know, I've got the intersectional aspect of being BAME and being disabled. So sometimes I, and both groups have been disproportionately impacted. So sometimes I analyze, it's good that we're addressing, we've had reports in relation to the disproportionate impact for BAME, but why isn't disability mentioned? Why are we not investigating the same aspect in relation to disability? We've recently reached the grim milestone of 70,000 deaths. So approximately we're talking 42,000 disabled people dying in the UK. The Coronavirus Act of 2020, it actually breached human rights for disabled people in the UK, suspending key protections in the Care Act, the Family Act, you know, we had 
people with learning disabilities in the UK having do not resuscitate put on their hospital beds with little or no consultation. We've, had, we've got statistics in the UK for people with learning disabilities aged 18 to 34, are 30 times more likely to die from COVID-19. And you would have thought, like even if you look at the campaign that I started, the no wheelchair tax campaign, that was supposed to be implemented in April for, for all the NHS hospitals in England, they've delayed it till January, but they still actually haven't sent NHS hospitals implementation guidelines. So I'm worried now they're going to be delaying it again. So a simple kind of systems change that will help to save disabled people's lives. Now I'm talking to politicians from the Tories and the Labour saying at least let's implement the disability element of the Tory manifesto, which was also the Labour manifesto. There's, there's a systematic violation of disabled people's rights in the UK. And just following on from your question, what I see happening is I see inequality for disabled people who have access to finance, who are digitally included, this, yeah, will be able to survive, there'll be opportunities. But for the disabled people who don't have access to finance, who are digitally excluded, as more and more of our products and services go online, so the NHS now is trying to discourage disabled people, high risk going into hospital. They want to set up Zoom calls, but currently they're not thinking about the digitally excluded actually. So it, I ha had it recently with my mum, a physiotherapy appointment. I could set up my mum on Zoom. She never uses the internet. She doesn't have email. Then I asked them, so what would happen if I wasn't here? And they said, oh, they would have a telephone call. How can you assess somebody over a phone for a physiotherapy appointment? You know, the, the system needs to recognize there's lots of digitally excluded people. It's not just good to go to a digital first model, but we need to have a systems and integrated approach. Otherwise we're gonna have so much inequality. Sorry, I just wanted to mention that because it, it, it really frustrates me. Please Joyce. And I think, you know, Kush has, has, has highlighted there is something we're all very familiar with. If you multiply that in so many parts of the world where there isn't, a, you know, a, a healthcare system, we're, it, we're way, way back in decades and probably centuries back in some parts of the world for disabled people. And poverty is one of the biggest challenges and it comes back to education and uh, so I think, you know, ourselves and whether we're inside organizations or, or outside, um, we shouldn't be afraid to be more vocal and to really speak out as, as the disabled community. We are the largest and, uh, you know, I think we've got better and, and bolder at that for sure. Um, but I think we have to get more so uh, across the elements. And it always comes back to having people who are themselves disabled involved in all of these elements, because that's when real change happens. Because if you're living, breathing, you understand as a disabled person, you understand what's needed and needs to be integrated at every step. And this is where it gets dropped off, you know, never uh, without us. It, it, it couldn't be further from the truth. And that's why these things drop off the radar, because there's always a pressure from something else and something else before and we have to stop that happening i don't know if if anyone else wants to to add on that uh mm -hmm. we we absolutely uh, agree uh, obviously uh i i agree with you all 100 percent unless unless and until you have disabled people at the top um it's it's not that it's not an important issue but other other urgent issues will seem more important to to mm -hmm. people who are uh, mm -hmm. the decision makers um and uh, and the way that we engage the way we engage the media mm -hmm. and the, the press and how you know just mm -hmm. like christian joyce said in terms of and jess you know just to, to create more awareness and to create uh you know, just more information and more knowledge and more kind of engagement, really, um, because it just it's to get to that tipping point, that critical mass, that it becomes a really relevant, important issue. And it is, we all know it is, but then I think it's that fear factor, the stigma, and continuing to get beyond that with different types of messaging, with different types of stories. And I think it's just a matter of continue being persistent. Yeah. 
-hmm. Absolutely. And our jobs, obviously, is to shed light on, on uh, these issues, on, uh, you know, on empowering uh, people to, um, to speak up and to self-advocate, but also uh, to organize. Um, we've heard in a, lo a lot of these conversations that uh, there's sometimes, because of maybe that, uh, that uh, lack of uh, you know, energy, um, to to speak up or to uh, you know to get out uh, of, of of your own bubble and not in the sense of getting out of your you know physical space only but talking and reaching out to other people as hard as it is um, but also you know this concept of organizing and there is power in numbers and we need to keep uh, talking about these numbers uh, we're talking about uh, roughly one fifth of the global population. Um, and uh, as, as we had on the very first talk we had uh, around accessibility, um, and Kush said this as well, we're going to go through a, a, an economic uh, um, you know, struggle. Uh, we're, already, we're already going through it and it's going to um, get a little bit worse before it gets better. There is, there is uh, power there in the disabled community to help in that economic recovery as well. So if we think about the numbers, uh, it's not only the right thing to do, it also seems to me that, like the smart thing to do, um, uh, to, to focus on, on you know, such a big part of the population that is there to, um, to help um, everyone get back on their feet um, when we are in a position to, uh, to leave our homes and, uh, and, and be out there in the economy in a physical sense, not only uh, in, a, in an online sense. We are uh, very much over time, um, unless uh, uh, any of our panelists would like to add anything uh, to what has been said. So Joyce, please go ahead. I just want to say a big, huge thank you to the work that you're doing at Integrated Dreams because it's so important and, and, and everybody involved, Kush and, and Eli, everybody, Jess, and, and, and I can see so many friends um, on, on the stream here that, uh, you know, all the great work you're doing and, and we have to keep that loud voice and, and, and keep pushing forward on all the fronts and uh, we mustn't get forgotten or lost behind because of COVID, which is a, is a, a sure uh, a, a, a danger that that will happen and we just need to be bold about it we've been quiet for a while and you look back to the early activism of disabled people maybe we need to energize some of that again and there is great uh, great energy but it, we need to perhaps get back to some of that energizing and uh, ensuring this is on everybody's platform and there are some great disability uh, advocates journalists themselves that we know are present but we probably need to encourage more of, of that as well and uh, um, yeah maybe we can try and mobilize some of them to come together in an international context because I think that's where the real strength will be making this an international context as much as we can and all the work that's gone before and needs to come. Absolutely catching that train that Eli was mentioning of uh, mm. the conversation around inclusion and mm. Black Lives Matter and uh, mm. the, which is global at the moment. Mm. Uh, Kush I wasn't sure if you were raising your hand uh you wanted to add anything yeah i was just gonna say but like following on from black lives matter i think it's a really good kind of example for a movement that for people of color you don't even need to be black quite honestly and sometimes there's so much wonderful work going in happening in relation to advocacy and disability rights but sometimes i feel it's quite fragmented that there's really good work happening here and happening here but it feels as though we don't work collectively. If we worked collectively, you know, you're talking about one quarter of the world's population, you know, like a disabled lives matter movement, then the, the world would change, like in, in the same way the world changed very quickly after the Black Lives Matter movement. I believe we need to, like Joyce was saying, and Eli and Jess, that we, if we have that collective movement as one unit supporting each other's campaign, We've created systems change. We're, we're, we're too many people for them to ignore us. It's as simple as that. 100%. Uh, I think we're seeing in, in a fashion and in the entertainment industry, some of these things happening. I think that maybe to kind of look at what's happening there and building those collective actions across the board. Yeah, no, it's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Eli. Jess. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think the the point that, that you're all making is so important that, you know, trying to coalesce all these disparate efforts that have been sort of on the fringes for so long um, and pull them all together to become something truly mainstream um, is is where the power lies. And and I, I see that momentum happening and I, I'm so proud to be a part of, of a collective that I think is really gonna make real fundamental change in the world. So thanks to all of you. Thanks right back at you. <laughs> We could talk all night, Joanna. Yeah. I know, I know. I, yeah, I, will, have, I will have you all night, mm -hmm. but I know we all have to go. Yeah. Um, thank you so, so much, everyone. Uh, I know you're all really busy people and, uh, you know, Zooming uh, nonstop. Um, we, we thank also everyone who joined uh, during the conversation. Uh, I apologize for not uh, giving much attention to all of the questions that were coming in, but uh, please, we, we will make sure to address you uh, at a later stage. We just uh, had absolutely no time uh, to go through those, those questions at the moment. Talking about uh, inclusive employment, um, we, we in, our, you know, in our small role the, that we play, uh, changing things and trying to push for, for change to happen. Um, next week, we have a conversation with the three of our participants in, in previous uh, program in previous years. When we're not doing the webinars, which we started this year because of, uh, of COVID, we have usually around this time of the year, the Football for All Leadership Program, um, the physical training uh, happening around uh, here in Lisbon. Uh, this year, of course, uh, we, we canceled. Um, but we hope to be next, uh, be back next year, and we'll be talking about uh, their journey um, with the three of our former participants. Uh, unfortunately, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, they're all male because we also have uh, disproportionate participation of uh, of male participants um, in the program, and we're trying to work on that. Uh, but uh, let me just share here um, their names. So next week, uh, we'll be talking to, um, uh, hopefully you can all see this. <laughs> uh, next week, we'll be talking to um, Eduardo Maia, who, no, no, you're not, you're not, you can't see this. Okay. Not at the no. moment, Joanna. Okay. We just see, sorry about that. These things tend to happen. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, now we lost Joanna. It was there, then it vanished. I think uh, I know there's Joanna. We uh, we I can't hear you, Joanna, but we we did see that and. Uh, Sorry, technical issues. Yeah. Uh, I'll just uh, I'll just uh, remove the image and I'll, uh, to avoid any issues. So we were talking to Eduardo, who's part from Portugal, and he uh, through the program he he's a basket a wheelchair basketball player actually, and through the program he uh, enrolled in an internship at the Portuguese FA, and he's now uh, a permanent employee there with the performance uh, health and performance unit. Um, we'd also be talking to Kieran Burns, who is the class of uh, 2019. He's from Scotland, and he's uh, kicked off with the uh, very uh, successful uh, podcast called All About Ability. Uh, talking about uh, mental health uh, in these times, I would encourage everyone to listen to, to Kieran's podcast. Super interesting conversations with uh, a lot of different, um, you know, athletes uh, and activists. Um, and also Thomas Hozier, who is uh, one of our youngest participants in, in 2018. Uh, Tom is uh, uh, an England uh, national futsal champion under 17, under 21. And at the age of 19, if I'm not mistaken, he launched his own company um, to, to have a, an inclusive uh, summer camp, um, football summer camp program. So um, I would encourage everyone uh, if, uh, to listen in. And if you know anyone who'd be interested in participating in a program like this, um, make sure to let them know that it's next week, uh, exactly in the, at, this, uh, at this time, 5 p.m. Uh, British Standard Time, 6 p.m. Central European Time. 
um, and, and all available for free uh, wherever you're joining from. Uh, do shoot us, uh, uh, you know, any questions you have uh, on participating um, if you're interested. Again, thank you so much to all our panelists. Um, I think this is the start uh, of many other conversations. And, uh, you know, we definitely keep pushing for, for things to change in our respective roles. Uh, looking forward to everyone's work uh, in, in what you're doing. Um, and we're always here to, to help uh, and make things change as well uh, in whichever way we can. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for bringing thank us you. together. Thank you. Thanks for thank the opportunity. Have a, have a lovely Wonderful. evening. Speak soon. Wonderful seeing you all. Bye-bye. Yeah, you too. Take, yeah, take care, care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.